Welcome. I'm WTOP Capitol Hill correspondent Mitchell Miller, and we're privileged to have a discussion on a very important topic today. Our focus, A Better Tomorrow, Tackling the Crisis of Mental Health in American Children, sponsored by Children's Hospital Association on WTOP.com. And joining us is Amy Knight, the president of Children's Hospital Association, and Congressman Jamie Raskin, the U.S. Representative for Maryland's 8th District. Welcome to both of you, and thank you very much for taking part with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So I'm going to start with you, Amy. The mental health of children and young people has received much more attention in recent years, especially after the pandemic. And looking at the broad issue, what are some of the factors that have led, in your view, to this crisis, and why do you think it acutely affects so many young people? Well, if we look even before the pandemic, I think a lot of times we pay attention to what the pandemic did to youth mental health. But if you look at the decade before the pandemic, we saw an increasing incidence of mental health conditions in children and youth. And the pandemic really exacerbated that. So what we have seen over time is particularly in children's hospitals, which is really um, the destination of last resort. So when they show up in our emergency rooms are often in crisis. Um, and the increase that we saw coming out of the pandemic and that continues today is an increase in children showing up in crisis, whether it's suicide ideation, suicide attempts, or just an acute exacerbation of mental health. Um, so in 2021, with the American Academy of Pediatrics and American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists, we declared a national emergency. And that persists today. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that and the great work that is happening um, in DC with Congress and with the administration, as well as what we can do to change that over time. And Congressman, you've been very involved in the issue of mental health. Uh, from a public policy standpoint, are these issues, in your view, getting the attention they deserve in Congress as well as elsewhere? Well, I think they finally are getting the attention they deserve. The COVID-19, as Amy just said, um, both exacerbated uh, the problem of mental health issues among young people, but it also... Uh, shown a bright light on those problems. Um, the COVID-19 was profoundly isolating and demoralizing for young people in America. The Surgeon General declared uh, a, a national crisis. There's this the private um, uh, collaborative also declaring a national mental health crisis among uh, the young. And I think people understand it just from their own families, from their neighbors, from what's taking place in schools. And so this is not some kind of um, peripheral or eccentric issue. I mean, this goes right to the heart of what kind of society we're going to be. And we've got to take the mental health of the population just as seriously as we're taking the physical health of the population. And Congressman, do you feel that while obviously the pandemic was a terrible thing in many, many ways, um, that in some ways it did shine a light on this issue that uh, as Amy noted, has been around for a long time, but it seemed to intensify things, at least in terms of public officials, government officials uh, getting more activated to address it. Yeah, I mean, we saw um, suicidal ideation uh, jump considerably uh, during that period. We saw um, expressed symptoms of anxiety, of depression go way up across the board, but especially among young people during that period. And since there was a lot more family intimacy, a lot of families really began to focus on the problem in a, a serious way. So I think the whole country is dealing with it. And you know, when you've got a majority of young people um, talking about depression, anxiety, other mental health symptoms they're suffering, it's very hard to stigmatize that anymore. So the conversation I think is replete um, throughout the country. And I think that there, um, people have begun to connect uh, the private problems that a lot of young people uh, are confessing to their families and friends to the broader uh, public problems that weigh so heavily on them, um, climate change and uh, the COVID-19 and the gun violence problem, all of these things um, inflict a lot of stress and damage on young people. And if you're already going through something like depression or anxiety, these things uh, really aggravate 
your symptoms and leave you quite vulnerable. And I think those are the questions that the country is really beginning to take up. Obviously, uh, Amy, children's hospitals deal with a lot of very, very difficult issues. What are you seeing in terms of mental health as far as facilities dealing with this? And what are some of the key issues that you're having to address? Yeah, I, I think as Congressman Raskin said, I mean, we're starting to talk about it as a society more. Um, and that's because our kids have given us permission to because they're talking about it as well. So I think we've seen that show up in emergency rooms and across children's hospitals, primary care practices, et cetera. But what it tells us is a community of, of um, folks that care about kids is that our system is broken. Um, if you're showing up in the emergency room, we don't have enough resources in the community to meet kids where they are, whether that be in schools, whether that be in families, making families equipped to have these discussions, um, primary care physicians, enough of a pediatric behavioral health workforce, whether not everyone needs a psychiatrist. Sometimes it's just a strong school counselor, another trusted adult, someone to, to head off what could eventually become a crisis. So we're learning a lot as a society right now and digging in and being curious about this will help us solve it in the end, listening to our kids and to what they need. But I think from a children's hospital perspective, we see the biggest opportunity is to, to build infrastructure in communities, um, just like we do for physical health. So, you know, if a child has asthma, they don't need to see a specialist every time. They can see a primary care physician, their parents and their teachers are educated to take care of it. So we, we need to create that same um, appreciation for mental health that we have for physical health. And related to emergency rooms, I was reading that recently several major medical associations had a warning about this that I'm sure you're that so many uh, children were going to emergency rooms and, and often, of course, they're not really uh, set up to deal with uh, specific mental issues. I wonder if you could talk about that and the challenge of dealing with that. Absolutely. So we've seen in children's hospitals across the country and in general hospitals too, a, a rapid increase in a number of kids presenting in crisis, as we talked about earlier. So what that does, um, typically, I mean, we've all been to the emergency room for a broken arm or maybe a, an infection or something of that nature. You're typically in and out in a number of hours. If a child presents an acute crisis, they're often um, potentially could harm themselves or could harm a family member as well. So we take that very seriously. So um, while they're not prepared to deal with a specialized mental health aspects, they certainly are prepared to deal with a child who is in crisis. Um, what happens as a result sometimes is because of what we talked about, there's a lack of resources in the community, um, whether that's an inpatient psychiatric bed, that could be an intensive outpatient program. It could just be a referral to a therapist to stabilize that patient. They often end up spending time, not a couple of hours, sometimes a couple of days, and sometimes a couple of weeks in, in our emergency rooms waiting to go where they actually can get the care that they need. So they are kept safe and they are, are attended to, obviously, their needs, um, their health needs and their mental health needs to some extent. But that specialized care is not best delivered in a pediatric emergency room or a pediatric hospital bed. It's in a specialized facility in a specialized area. So we call that boarding. Um, you can board for a number of reasons, but the mental health boarding has increased. I think nearly 90% of our hospitals have reported an increase in boarding in the past year or two. Um, and those board those boarding times have gone from a few hours or a few days to sometimes a few weeks and in worst case scenarios, a few months. And we know that's not the best place for these children to be. And it has to be very difficult for parents because they're just looking for help, but may not know exactly what all their options might be. And it seems that, um, you know, a lot of the, as you said, the emergency rooms, the boarding issue, uh, all of this kind of builds up. Uh, and it's it appears that there needs to be more education about what the options are for people. Not only education about what the options are, but make sure that those options are completely accessible to all families. That's often the challenge. So um, if a pediatrician or your family physician refers you to someone, a psychiatrist or a therapist that has a 10 week wait period and you have a child that needs attention now, that's not helping that family. Um, so we have a number of levers that we're supporting um, in, in Congress right now to look at it and bolstering that pediatric workforce so that we have more providers, again, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, family therapists, social workers to be able to deal with these to meet families where they are when they need help. 
not not months after the the um, situation has occurred. So that certainly is one option. And the second is really looking at how we support those um, providers once they're in practice. Um, we have far too many providers that only take cash payments because insurance and Medicaid don't sufficiently reimburse them for, for the care that they provide. So we need to treat um, mental health as we've talked about the same as we do physical health in those situations. And Congressman, from your perspective, do you think lawmakers and members of Congress and even state legislatures have done enough to respond to some of these issues uh, that we've just been talking about, providing more infrastructure, providing more support uh, for communities and, and other levels of uh, mental health care? Um, yeah, um, well, I think a lot of members' families have been uh, touched by this crisis, and those are the members who tend to get most deeply involved. Um, but I'm seeing more of it across the board. I've got a colleague, uh, Representative Napolitano, who I'm working with on um, legislation that uh, tries to deal with the tremendous shortage we have in mental health professionals who are focused on adolescent and ch child uh, populations. And um, it would, the, the, the bill that she's worked out would um, set up to $250,000 in um, loan um, repayment forgiveness for people who go into the mental health field because we have a shortage of tens of thousands of people across the country who are needed in schools or needed in hospitals. Um, you know, a majority of kids who are suffering from depression are not in a therapeutic relationship with a mental health professional. And, you know, there are entire counties in the country that don't have an adolescent psychiatrist. So we're talking about tremendous shortages. And some of those are just supply demand problems that we just don't have the supply of people. Some of them are the obstacles that are created by uh, insurance companies to people getting the coverage that they need. So, um, you know, there's a host of problems to work on. And I am finding that more and more colleagues are getting engaged with it. And of course, I know we're going to talk about uh, about suicide in 988, but a lot of colleagues got involved in that. Right. And I was going to ask you about another piece of legislation. But before we do that, I wanted to go back to Amy. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about the challenges of um, getting these healthcare workers to not only um, stay on the job, but not leave um, the healthcare field. You know, we had obviously a lot of people uh, leaving the healthcare field after pan the pandemic. People were simply just burned out. Uh, how has the industry tried to, to deal with that? Well, I think we're dealing with that as a nation right now across our workforce in general, and it, it's probably magnified in the healthcare field and then further magnified in behavioral health. It's a tough area to work in. You, These are caregivers or people, they, they not only provide care, they are actually really caring individuals. And so taking care of their mental health is also incredibly important in making sure that they have the resources they need to show up healthy and happy each day to provide the care that they're giving. So really hospitals and healthcare organizations across the country and especially children's hospitals are doubling down on meeting employees where they are too, making sure that they um, are, are taken care of both not only in their job satisfaction, but also in their personal well-being. Um, so they're looking at flexible schedules, other alternatives, as, as we've talked about, that's really hard in the mental health space right now when you already have shortages. Um, so, you know, money is always uh, an option and one thing, but providing that overall well-being is incredibly important to this next generation. We're spending a lot of time thinking about pipelines and how you get more people into the field. As, as Congressman Raskin said, that's a, a huge area and a huge opportunity, and we applaud their efforts in that space. Um, but that takes time, you know, so we need to keep the people that we have and, and grow the next generation of workforce at the same time. And, and we're all in on, on helping um, and partnering with Congress to do that. And one of the pieces of uh, legislation, Congressman, that you are a co-sponsor of bipartisan legislation is the CONNECT Act to provide individuals uh, experiencing mental health issues with follow-up services. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, but obviously follow-through is essential and critical in this field. It, it's not like, uh, you know, spraining your uh, ankle and then just 
you know, gets wrapped up and then it heals and then it's over. I mean, we're talking about the necessity of, con you know, continuing um, care. And that's what the Connect Act is all about. Um, we're, we're looking for different ways of compensating for the shortage of um, mental health uh, professionals. Um, and uh, one of them uh, is through the Pediatric Mental Health Care Access Program. Um, and um, this is at the Health Resources and Services Administration. And what this does is, is it tries to train pediatricians to recognize uh, you know, signs of mental health problems and then to uh, render basic mental health treatment for kids who otherwise wouldn't be getting any. And it sets up uh, a hotline for pediatricians to get in touch with experts on how to deal with particular kinds of situations. So that's gonna be another piece in the puzzle is to get um, the, you know, the everyday pediatricians to be able to do more of this work and in um, you know, the most serious or egregious cases to funnel people into the right direction to get the expert care that they need. Um, so um, you know, all, all of these different approaches are, um, meant to create uh, a more comprehensive uh, attempt to address the problem so nobody falls through the cracks. And so um, in the American Rescue Act, we were able to get some money uh, to the schools to increase the number of mental and behavioral health counselors that are present in the schools. And that's uh, a commitment that we just need to keep up. I mean, this is a, a national crisis that we're in, as the Surgeon General has said, as the various children's health associations uh, have said, and we've got to uh, act like it and do whatever we can to surge people into the field to get others to come and help out and then to create, as with the Connect Act, the, Act, the long-term services and programmatic uh, commitment that will allow people to recover and to stay well. One of the obviously most serious issues related to mental health is suicide. It is a tough topic to talk about, but we are here to talk about mental health. And so first for you, Amy, um, there have been growing efforts to address the issue of suicide. Can you tell us about the Preventing Youth Suicide National Collaborative? Yes, the Preventing Youth Suicide National Collaborative, which is sponsored by the Cardinal Health Foundation, is, was started in 2022. Um, and so as we speak, there's now 30 children's hospitals participating. And this is a true um, example of partnership and collaboration and how we can accelerate our actions. So children's hospitals are obviously very concerned about suicide in their communities and in their patient populations. Um, the Cardinal Health Foundation is totally on board with that. And then the Zero Suicide Institute um, provides proven has demonstrated skills in doing this. So these 30 hospitals are working together um, within their own patient populations. We have found that oftentimes, um, obviously kids who are experiencing um, chronic or lifelong illnesses may be more predisposed to depression and to suicide and suicide ideation. Also, um, there's been numbers of studies that have shown that children, whether in the community or in other places that have committed suicide have recently had an interaction with the healthcare system. So how can we as providers, whether it's hospitals, primary care physicians, identify those cases earlier? So the collaborative is really working to decrease suicide in patient populations and communities by data-driven examples to, to understand and intervene in children and identify um, those at-risk youths earlier and to create interventions that, that mitigate um, what they're experiencing emotionally and ultimately hope to impact their decision um, and prevent their decisions to consider taking their own lives. So we've seen great success in some adult healthcare systems. As we know, kids are very different than adults and how we interact with and anticipate them and the whole family is different. So these hospitals are very excited to be on the front end of this. Um, and as an organization, we have over 200 children's hospital members. And our hope is to share those learnings to communities throughout the United States um, and really make a difference in, in the kids that we serve. And Congressman Raskin, you have spoken bravely and eloquently about dealing with your son, Tommy, who died of suicide and dealt with depression. Uh, your family has been through so much, uh, but what are some of the things 
that you learned through this difficult experience that might help other families dealing with a loved one who is struggling with mental health issues? Well, um, Tommy battled depression for several years before we lost him on the last day of 2020. Um, and so we obviously talked about mental health and we talked about um, depression, but I am, you know, always sorry to say that we very rarely talked about suicide. And I think it's such a dread taboo subject for so many families that we think that if we mention the word, it's going to somehow conjure the thing into being. Um, and it might be closer to the reverse, that if you don't talk about it, it endows it with all kinds of mystery that, um, you know, that make it seem more like, um, you know, a forbidden fruit or something. And so, I mean, I've written about this, how I feel strongly that it's very important that we talk about suicide. And we say that, you know, when people get very desperate in their depression or their anxiety or you know, different kinds of mental health conditions. It's something that comes up and that there are ways that we have to deal with it and, um, and you know, think of it as a medical problem and a, a break from the normal course of things that the whole family, the whole friendship circle needs to get involved in. And um, uh, otherwise, I think it becomes too much of an interior monologue for whoever's going through a mental health, um, a mental health crisis. And um, so, um, it, you know, it continues to be an extremely tough time for young people because of some of the intrinsic mental health problems we've talked about. And then also, you know, such difficulty in the world, such polarization, such bullying. Uh, I saw a very interesting article in the paper yesterday about the physical um, and cognitive effects of bullying on the young person's brain and how it actually changes their way of processing information and increases their uh, fight or flight reflex and you know paranoia. Um, I mean, it's it's got an affinity to traumatic stress syndrome when people are when young people are bullied repeatedly. And so we we have kind of a bullying environment that we've entered into as a country and that filters all the way down to the elementary school yard. Um, and um, we, you know, we need to do everything we can to improve conditions in the country, improve the way that we relate to each other, make sure that we're uh, making mental health services available to people, but also doing whatever we can to reject bullying and cruelty and the kinds of hostility that make life tough for millions and millions of people. And you've spoken about your son and how sensitive he was and how caring he was for so many uh, parts of our lives. Um, and you, I know your family provided an, an incredible amount of support, but still families, when they get in a situation similar to this, um, it's has to be so difficult because they feel so alone, or as you said, the individual feels the internal monologue, the family is trying to do what's right, and it, it just has to be difficult to figure out exactly, for many people at least, how who to reach out to and, and how to get that assistance. Right. So, you know, and, and that's why I've been convinced that we just need really practical tips and assistance for people telling them what to do. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wrote about how at one point Tommy said to me, he didn't know whether or not he could ever really be happy. And I launched into this big disquisition about happiness and the things that make people happy and doing things and exercise and activity and so on. And I mean, I obviously meant well, but the real answer should have been to just say, are you having suicidal thoughts? Are you thinking about, you know, doing something to harm yourself? Because we should immediately call someone and go, you know, I mean, that wasn't immediately before we lost him, but it was, you know, several weeks before it. And so they're just things like that, that I wish I'd done differently. And uh, that's why I tell people, you know, it's, um, 
you know, it's probably, it's diff difficult to utter the words, but it's just so much better to talk about it and put it out on the table. And, and it's better for us as a society to be talking about it so we don't lose anybody else, you know. Well, certainly our condolences continue to go out to your family. And, and Amy, I wonder if you could pick up on the congressman's point that it is a very difficult word to even say, uh, particularly when you're talking with uh, one of your children. Uh, what are your thoughts about how the language and how we've talked, how we talk about suicide has changed and, and what needs to evolve related to it? Well, I would echo really what Congressman Raskin said. Um, you know, I think uttering the word is difficult for a lot of people. And we think that by mentioning it, we're actually potentially encouraging it or giving someone an idea. And I think there's a lot of um, strong research recently has shown it is the exact opposite, that these honest conversations. And again, I'll go back to my point earlier that kids have given us such permission to talk about mental health that when I was growing up, it was not even a topic that was okay to talk about. It was something that was wrong. And now it's part of who we are. Like we talk about everything else. So um, we're putting our own stigma and our own labels by not talking about suicide. And I think all of us, those of us who are trying to change the system at the forefront of this are adults. And so listening to our kids and letting them lead the way on this, there's many um, resources out there for children now, and Congressman Raskin has identified some and I know is working on others, um, that kids can access immediately. They don't have to go to the hospital, but being able to talk about it to families and families having that practical advice and those practical things, just like we have poison hotline numbers and things of that nature, we've made all of that okay to talk about. So we can do this. I have every confidence that as a society and as a community, we can we can make change here and make it okay for, for kids to have these feelings to talk about it and to react purposefully, not overreact, not out of fear, but out of a, you know, a, a conscious way forward that we're partners and that we're here for them. I think that's oftentimes what, what kids need to hear, but I think as parents, and we often wanna be enough and sometimes it's not enough. This is, this is an illness and it is treatable. And the sooner we can treat it, the better the outcome long-term, just like any physical ailment. There are kids that have never been hospitalized for asthma or a diabetes exacerbation or things of that nature. So um, we have 25% of our kids in this country or people in our country that are under the age of 18. Um, and so we should be seeking to get them the resources they need so that we have happier and healthier adults. Um, and the ability to talk about these things candidly is, a, is an excellent start there. And Congressman, you have poured a lot of energy into legislation related to mental health. Uh, one of the things that you did was introduce legislation to create a 988 suicide and crisis hotline, and you've renewed that legislation. Uh, what can you tell us about how that's worked and, and what it means going forward? Well, I think generally it's working really well. The, the number 988 has caught on. The premise of the legislation was that everybody who's in a mental health crisis should have someone to call and someone to come and find them and somewhere to go. And, um, you know, we're in the process of trying to integrate it with local and regional mental health infrastructures, call centers, um, responsive units to get people out there. And, and this is tangentially related, of course, to the, uh, the problem we've had with um, in lots of communities about police violence because the police have been called in lots of places to deal with what's a mental health crisis. And of course, they're not always trained to do that and that's not their specialty. And so 988 is also um, involved in the process of trying to build up the local, regional and national infrastructure um, for suicide prevention and mental health crises um, so that the, the, right, the right people and the right kinds of uh, emergency teams are getting out to, to respond. And as a policymaker, you're well aware that there are sometimes issues where uh, there can be well-meaning legislation from the congressional standpoint or from the federal standpoint, uh, but it doesn't get down to that level that you were just speaking about. Has that been a challenge or do you think you're kind of working through some of those hurdles? Yeah, I think there's been great uh, interaction between um, the the federal um, officials involved and the state and local officials. I know certainly I've followed it closely in Maryland, where there's been, um, you know, 
excellent efforts to integrate the local and regional uh, response structure. In fact, that there is legislation in Maryland that they named after Tommy um, that um, allows people to sign up for um, if they've gone through a mental uh, health crisis, they've talked to someone and they've been, you know, put in a better frame of mind in a better place, they can ask for someone to call them regularly on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, whatever, in order to check up on them. Um, but, you know, it, as we're saying, I mean, it's a very complicated problem with so many different dimensions to it that um, there are lots of different things that can be done and that are being done. You know, I introduced another um, bill that ended up uh, passing as part of broader legislation called the CAMERA Act, um, which um, authorizes the NIH to engage in a study of the effect of social media, um, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and all of these different forums on um, adolescent and child health, mental and physical health in the country. And there might be some positive things and there might be some negative things, but we've never had really a comprehensive governmental study focusing on that question. And um, as you know, I've been very concerned about the whole bullying problem and the impact that that has on the psychological and emotional health of kids and um, and even some of the you know internalized um, comparing that young people do when they go on to social media that I'm you know not as beautiful as, this kid, I'm not as rich as this kid, and like, what sorts of effects does that have? So um, we want to look at it from uh, all angles, but above all, we want to listen to young people themselves who are going through so many of the questions we're talking about, and to try to figure out from there where we can meet them and where we can address the problem. And as you alluded to earlier, there has been bipartisan efforts uh, from members of both parties trying to address a lot of these issues. And Amy, one of the pieces of legislation that has bipartisan support is the Helping Kids COPE Act. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about uh, your thoughts on that and, and other efforts to address some of these issues. Yeah, ab absolutely. The um, Helping Kids COPE Act has um, been introduced in the House by Lisa Blunt Rochester from Delaware and Brian Fitzpatrick from um, Pennsylvania and really takes critical steps to doing what we talked about earlier, really building that mental health workforce um, non-physician as well as um, some of the efforts that aligned on the physician side. So it really focuses on how we start to solve the problem by creating that awareness and the capability in our communities to do that. So we're very excited about that, as well as a number of the other pieces that have been mentioned. I think perhaps the most important thread and theme that we're hearing here is this is a bipartisan issue. You know, Congress. Congressman Raskin referenced the strain and the stress that the polarization of our society puts on our kids, and that is incredibly real. Um, mental health conditions in kids don't discriminate along party lines, or along rural and urban, or along rich and poor, along race. It is every child that's been impacted and every family that's been impacted. So we have an opportunity in a time when things are difficult to get done to, to move some things on behalf of kids. And we're incredibly grateful for that bipartisan support and, and hope it'll grow stronger. Um, it's an opportunity we have to to make a difference for our children, hopefully our future. And um, it's one of the few things we can point to today where we have some some level of agreement and sponsorship and grateful to Congressman Raskin and his colleagues for continuing to, to lead through this. All right. If I can add one thing yeah, to that. Ahead. Well, I, uh, I agree very much with what Amy just said. It's, you know, one of the things that we work on in Congress where we really can get support across the board because every every family in America has been touched by this in one way or another. Um, and I would just say in, in a certain sense, it's much broader than bipartisan because of course there are millions of Americans who are sick of both of our parties and are doing other things. It's <laughs> it's independents, it's Democrats, it's Republicans, it's Greens, it's Libertarians. It's, I mean, everyone can understand this and um, we need nationwide focus on this just like we need a nationwide focus on climate change, which is not an entirely distinct issue because if you spend any time talking to adolescents and young people or people in their 20s, they will tell you how much um, the weather calamities we're seeing everywhere from Hawaii to Vermont to Florida to the drought and the flooding and so on, how much this weighs on them. 
Um, and, um, you know, one thing Tommy used to talk to us about with his sisters was, you know, is it ethical to have children at a time when everything seems to be going downhill in terms of our environment? And I thought that there was something unusual about Tommy raising that, but it's turned out since we lost him, I hear young people about talking about this all the time. Um, just like gun violence is something that I think really weighs on the hearts and minds of this generation. I mean, every time there's another spectacular explosion of gun violence someplace, they wonder why it is as a society, we can't respond to this nightmare. And Amy, are you seeing that uh, in connection with mental health that Young people today, I mean, they're very self-aware, uh, and as the congressman alluded to, you know, social media, of course, plays a big role in that, um, both, you know, maybe from a, an unhealthy standpoint to an area where they're getting more information. Absolutely. I think the enthusiasm on, around this topic, among other topics, we have a very passionate youth right now. Um, and I think it, it's regardless, again, of where they live or where they're from, it almost always comes up. You know, I, I have to say I'm a little bit inspired and hopeful by our next generation of youth because they're dealing with these issues openly. Um, having dropped a child off at college a couple of weeks ago, it was everywhere on campus and the discussions of, among youth and what they've started to support each other as well as um, the leadership, et cetera. So it's a topic that's not going away. And I think if we look at the data, it says that as well, you know, most things go undiagnosed for 10 or more years and the onset of most mental health conditions is before the age of 14. Um, so, so these are real issues that we, can, we can't address. And by, I think, making it federal, making it local, I mean, a lot of this ends up at the local situation, but the federal government is doing a lot to provide that framework for, for local authorities to, to act and to access resources outside of their communities as well because it's gonna take all of us to solve it. And I, I think the kids are gonna be at the forefront leading the way on this in many, in many ways. Congressman Raskin, you have introduced and co-sponsored a lot of legislation in connection with mental health issues. And I understand that you are also going to be introducing new legislation uh, related to a grant program. I wonder if you could talk to us about that. When kids are in mental health crisis, um, oftentimes they will show up in the emergency room with their families. And if, as is way too often the case, there are no beds in hospitals in um, a mental health uh, division, um, then either they're gonna end up spending time in the emergency room, but those beds run out quickly too, or they're just gonna be sent home. And so um, I'm working on legislation that will provide grants um, to the hospitals and different programs around the country that would allow for more outpatient service programs, day programs, and other opportunities to get kids uh, into some kind of therapeutic relationship and setting when they're having a crisis and not just say, sorry, there's no room at the inn, we're going to send you home. Um, and, you know, for the same reason, I've been a big supporter of um, uh, Representative Fitzpatrick and Representative Eshoo's legislation called the Strengthen Kids Mental Health Now Act, um, which would put $10 billion over five years, $2 billion a year um, into uh, both pediatric um, mental health inpatient programs and beds, but also um, creating the kind of intensive outpatient services that I want to try to help immediately with a, with a grant program. So all of these things are trying to channel social resources um, into the issue on the theory that when we put staff uh, on the ground, when we put programs on the ground and we open up the conversation in um, communities across the land, including lots of communities that have never had anything like this, um, then we're uh, gonna help a lot of people and potentially save uh, lives. And Amy, you talked earlier about the issue of boarding and how it is a big problem. Um, do you think this, as we've been discussing this more holistic uh, approach, tackling various issues all at once can help to deal with some of these issues as far as the practical issue of 
literally having people in uh, children in hospitals for too long. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's going to take every effort we can develop to really solve this. There's not a, there's not a magic pill here that's going to change this. And and so having those resources and that, and those programs and, and having grants, because grants ultimately lead to sustainable programming. So if we can prove that these are effective programs, um, which we know and think that they are, um, then hopefully long-term those will become more supported and they, they don't require grants because they're part of our ecosystem of the behavioral health care system. So one of the, the acute things we hear from every hospital is the lack of what Congressman Raskin just said, of, of strong intensive outpatient programs where they can refer a patient who doesn't need to be hospitalized, doesn't need round-the-clock care, but needs that strong support for a period of time in order to, to level set their, their illness and, and be able to function back in society. And then have those check-ins, just like we all go to our periodic check-ins for whatever we might be dealing with, um, whether it's just our normal health or, or a disease process and making sure that we equip communities to deal with that. These are often not one and done things. They don't require intensive outpatient therapy over time, but they require um, a, an intensive period of treatment and then a, a sustained plan for, for going forward. And the more we can do to provide that, the, the stronger we'll be as a society. All right. And to round things out, uh, both of you have alluded to the fact that uh, one of the things that seems to have been happening is that the stigma of mental health issues seems to be going away or at least fading a little bit. Um, I'm wondering if you feel encouraged by that. And I wanted to kind of end on a uh, a look ahead note, if you will, um, what are some of the encouraging things uh, that both of you are seeing in terms of addressing youth mental health? I'll, I'll start with you, Congressman Raskin. Well, there is public conversation going on, and I want to thank you for conducting this one, which uh, will be important for people in our area to get to tune in and to hear about the different things we're working on. Um, you know, I would say that um, the stigma is lifting. Um, from um, people generally, but young people coming forward to talk about the mental health problems they're having. And I think, you know, this is a generation that is beyond uh, racism and misogyny and immigrant bashing and uh, homophobia. And they're also really getting beyond the stigma around mental health care. They're speaking openly and honestly about it. And I think the stigma is shifting from people who have suffered from uh, mental uh, health conditions to people who create them by bullying and by engaging in violence and by um, making society um, an unwelcoming place for a lot of people. I mean, racism um, is a huge mental health problem. Um, and, um, you know, it has caused problems for victims of racism and those who are afraid they will be victims of racism for a long time. And now suddenly we're putting that out in the open and that's helping a lot of people. But at the same time, um, forgive me for, you know, speaking in broader political terms here, um, but there is a struggle on earth between the autocrats and the dictators and the bullies, the people like uh, Vladimir Putin and Orban and Marcos and Xi in China versus the democracies. And sometimes people say to me, well, you know, we, we know how passionate you are about democracy and the constitution. We didn't know that you were working on mental health in the same way. And of course I got very interested in it after, uh, after we lost Tommy. Um, but I really view it as really connected because in a, a, a dictatorship in an uh, in unfree society, like what is developed in Russia, especially after the brutal invasion of Ukraine, um, they don't, the, the leaders don't really care about the health of the population, the physical health or the mental health of the population. If anything, it's a threat to them. Um, and the leaders become more and more deranged and pathological in how they behave. But in a democratic society, we need everybody working at their best. We need everybody to be able to participate and to go to school and to work um, and to um, you know, help us govern. I mean, that's what it means to live in a democratic society. So we need to take the mental health of the population seriously. And, um, and of course we wanna extend an ethic of care to everybody in the society, which is the opposite of what goes on in the authoritarian 
uh, governments and nations. So I do think it it goes right to the heart of what kind of democracy, what kind of society we're going to be, as Amy was saying. And Amy, as somebody who has worked uh, on this issue for a long time and has seen what we've talked about, this evolving discussion uh, in the United States where, where we do seem to be having a freer discussion related to this, what are some of your final thoughts about where things are headed and are you encouraged by some of the recent developments? I, I think, you know, we're very encouraged and I, and I would say I personally am as well. And and, and that's for a couple of things. One, again, we're talking about the kids and as Congressman Raskin just talked about, they're willing to talk about anything. So I don't think the stigma is completely lifted, but I would love for the stigma to be on those that won't talk about it in many ways, because we will be stronger and we will be better um, because of it. The other piece, which I would highlight um, you know, as this happens in, in every community and, and I represent and we represent numbers of hospitals, and I get to work every day with amazing clinicians and people who think about this very seriously. And the one thing they always ask is, how are we going to know if we've made a difference? That's ultimately, how are we going to measure what does success look like? So I think um, one of my aspirations and hope is that we as a society can identify what does success look like? And perhaps it's that, that um, generation of healthy human beings that Congressman Raskin talked about, because we have fewer kids today than we did numbers of years ago. We have a lot more baby boomers. So we need them to, to lead and to govern and to teach and to care for um, for our society and, and our nation going forward. So I'm very inspired by the youth and very hopeful with the attention that's been given by Congress, the administration, people at large, and especially in local communities. I think we're seeing them rise to the occasion on a number of levels, school districts, actively engaging philanthropists, others acutely aware of and acutely caring about this issue. Well, on that encouraging note, I would like to thank both of you, Amy Knight, the president of Children's Hospital Association, Congressman Jamie Raskin, the U.S. Representative for Maryland's 8th District. Thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you, Mitchell. Thanks to everyone. I'm your moderator, Mitchell Miller, on the discussion A Better Tomorrow, Tackling the Crisis of Mental Health in American Children, sponsored by Children's Hospital Association on WTOP.com.